Greetings. The title of this lecture is Expansionism. In a message to Congress in 1823, President James Monroe declared that the, quote, American continents by the free and independent conditions which they have assumed and maintained are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. That the United States would answer any European nation's attempt to extend its political system to the Americas was one of four points unilaterally pronounced by Monroe that later became known as the Monroe Doctrine. European nations regarded Monroe's position as arrogant and hostile, but many Americans, but for many Americans, such a position harmonized with the emergent spirit for expansionism and they received it favorably. The acquisition of new land for the United States was confidently maintained by Americans who believed their path was guided by providence. This display of conviction towards expansionism could, be, could also be found in revivalism, given that Charles Grandison Finney wrote in his memoirs that revivals had become so powerful and extensive that men were afraid to oppose them. Some historians argue that from the years 1800 to 1860, the dominant theme in America was Protestant revivalism. This magnificent era of revivals depicted American culture's search for national identity. In that search, the revival could easily demonstrate the intense vigor of the American people. Quote, the kind of revival stimulated by Charles Grandison Finney in upstate New York was a mass uprising, a release of energy, a sweep of the people which made it an expression of that energy we call Jacksonian America. End of quote. This energy found its way in many places, including expansionism. In 1845, Jacksonian Democrat and journalist John O'Sullivan warned that Americans warned Americans that England and France were quote swarting our policy and hampering our power, limiting our greatness and, and checking the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. Coined by O'Sullivan, the term manifest destiny confirmed an earlier belief that the United States, as God's chosen nation, had a sacred obligation to spread over all North America. The manifest destiny of the American Republic to possess the continent west of the Pacific had grown from political catchword to presidential policy. Christian rhetoric was common as politicians promoted expansionism as early as four decades before O'Sullivan's warning. In 1802, Senator James Jackson declared that, quote, God and nature has destined New Orleans and the Floridas to belong to this great and rising empire. On the issue of Indian removal from land, because of their alleged failure to farm, Representative Richard Wilde of Florida stated in 1830 that Jacob will forever obtain the inheritance of Esau. We cannot alter the laws of providence, end of quote. Supporting expansion ventures in the West, Representative Orlando Ficklin claimed in 1846 that a, quote, 
wild spirit of adventure wakens in the breast a kindred feeling with that which animated from our first parents in the Garden of Eden. In an early 1846 address before the House of Representatives, former President John Quincy Adams proclaimed that all Oregon belonged to the United States. Basing his argument on verses from the Bible, Adams argued that, quote, the foundation of title to the land is laid in the first chapter of Genesis, and it is in this book that the title to jurisdiction, to eminent domain, to individual property had its foundation. Adams continued stating that America's claim to Oregon could be supported in Christ's words. Quote, go forth and preach to all nations my gospel and I will be with you to the end of the world. According to Adams, the United States differed from Great Britain given that Americans less interest in hunting furs sought to make the wilderness blossom as a rose to establish laws to increase, multiply and subdue the earth which we are commanded to do by the first behest of God Almighty, end of quote. In 1844, Democrat Senator James Buchanan declared that, quote, Providence had given to the American people a great and important mission to spread the blessings of Christian liberty. Other Americans voiced a similar message. On the prospect of annexing, annexing Texas, a poet wrote, we do not follow out our destiny. Sorry, we do but follow out our destiny as did the ancient Israelite. Although Mexico controlled California, the American Review proclaimed in 1846 that, quote, no one who cherishes a faith in the wisdom of an overruling providence and who sees the silent operation of an invisible but omnipotent hand can believe it to be the interest of humanity, hum, humanity that this vast and magnificent region should continue forever in its present state. In Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California, Langsford W. Hastings visualized that California's republicanism and democracy would, quote, stand forth as enduring monuments to the increasing wisdom of man and the infinite kindness and protection of an all wise and ever ruling providence. Contemplating a possible war with Mexico, the Hartford Times in 1845 wrote that God would call Americans, quote, to redeem from unhallowed hands a land above all others favored of heaven and hold it for the use of a people who know how to obey heaven's behest. Two years later, an unidentified Pennsylvania wrote a letter to the Washington Daily Union calling the war, quote, the religious execution of our country's glorious mission under the direction of divine providence to civilize and Christianize and rise up from anarchy and degradation, a most ignorant, indolent, wicked, and unhappy people. The countless manifest destiny type arguments and expressions reflected the prevailing evangelical spirit and reform movement that came from the widespread revivals of early United States. Revivals that became, 
became become an essential part of the American religious system. And corresponding to the growth of revivalism was the surge of territorial expansion. Although the perception of the distant West had yet to be transformed from a terra incognita to a paradoso, the acquisition of the Louisiana ter territory in 1803 shared the boldness of a revival message that promised a sense of freedom. An important issue which fueled the expansionist spirit that America was a covenant people was the realization that the West was not a barren wilderness, but rather a land of rich natural resources. As mostly white Americans successfully conquered valuable westward lands with rifle, ax, plow, and church, there was the suggestion of a sure divine election. In 1835, well-known clergyman Lyman Beecher, who supported revival activity and the virtues of the West, declared that Jonathan Edwards' opinion in the previous century that the millennium, the peaceful reign of Jesus Christ on earth, would begin in America seemed to be supported by providential developments in the 19th century, maintaining that the chosen region of the nation was the West. Beecher preached that God, quote, had prepared the West to be mighty. Beecher believed that Providence had awarded the American people the advantage of an agricultural paradise and concurrent with the political ideology of the 1830s and 1840s, there was the notion of the rise of the common man. The West was increasingly interpreted as an essentially homogeneous homogeneous society in which class stratification was of minor importance. Thus, the wealthy virgin land of the egalitarian West became an American Eden where Anglo-Saxons could demonstrate their new sense of equality. This idea of a leveling effect was not unusual in a period when revivalists preached a message that through Christ, the common man could become worthy and dignified. Now I want to take a look at historiography and a number of studies that are helpful in understanding expansionism. Historians writing in the 20th century offer interesting insights on the expansionist spirit. Examining such issues as the doctrine of natural right, the theory of geographical predestination, and the concept of extension of freedom and the mission of regeneration, Albert Weinberg's Manifest Destiny, a study of nationalist expansionism in American history, published in 1935, remains one of the classic studies on the ideological underpinnings of expansionism. According to Weinberg, the philosophy of manifest destiny is, quote, the doctrine that one nation has a pre preeminent social worth, a distinctly lofty mission, and consequently unique rights in the application of moral principles. Such a definition portrays trademark Christian symbolism. But Weinberg's interpretation of manifest destiny takes a philosophical approach which undervalues religious thought. 
although he notes that references to the term providence in the literature of expansionism almost equal that found in theological publications, this important point did not undergo close scrutiny. In the movement for the acquisition of all Mexico, 1846 to 1848, John D. P. Fuller admits the difficulty in discerning the relative strength of various ideological currents running through society. This particular study came one year after Weinberg, so it was published in 1936. Dealing with probabilities, the arguments by the student of public opinion can often be questionable. With this in mind, Fuller set out to demonstrate that the fervent demands for the whole annex annexization of Mexico became progressively stronger among both Democrats and Whigs as the war between the United States and Mexico continued. And the, the Whigs are the politicians, forerunners of the Republican Party that, that will be on the scene in a, in a few short years. Like Weinberg, Fuller did not raise the issue of a possible relationship between the growth of expansionism and evangelicalism, but he did on separate occasions employ evangelical rhetoric. He writes, uh, quote, the apostles of manifest destiny who sought final victory over Mexico and of a pro-annexation political campaign, quote, that assumed the character of religious revival with his reliance on appeal to be to the emotions. Moreover, Fuller acknowledges that one of the motives for annexation was the desire to extend Protestant Christianity. The role that conservative Protestant clergymen played in the annexation issue received significant attention in John R. Bodo's The Protestant Clergy and Public Issues. 1812 to 1848. This study was published in 1954. The focus of, of Bodo's studies are that what he calls theocrats. And he, he defines these theocrats as college educated clergymen from the Northeast who with the exception of the Methodist theocrats, primarily upheld Calvinistic doctrine and were wary of the excessive individualism of the age. According to Bodu, there was some opposition by the theocrats to America's territory expansion of the early 19th century. Still, in many cases, their resistance was muted as there was considerable interest in the missionary potential of the frontier, given that some missionaries facilitated expansionism in Oregon. Turning to the issue of the Mexican War, Bodu acknowledges that only the congregational theocrats that is the leaders of congregationalism, that, that Protestant denomination, only the congregational theocrats fully opposed the conflict. Others either remain hush or support the war effort. Among the more individualistic Methodists, there, were, there was no sign of opposition. Bodo suggests that the reason that the war was supported by many Protestants rested on the fact that the conflict, quote, promised an opportunity for missionary expansion into Catholic territory, a most welcome challenge. It appeared 
that the missionary argument of preaching the message of Christ had become linked to the secular expansionist argument of extension of freedom. Bodo's study is important because it implies that conservative Protestant clergymen were involved in the promotion of the doctrine of manifest destiny. Although John William Ward's Andrew Jackson, symbol for an age, and this was published in 1955, although Ward's book focuses predom predominantly on the revered president, his book does offer valuable insight on the spirit of manifest destiny. Drawing on a wide variety of primary sources, which include popular folk songs, Ward argues that the concepts of nature, providence, and will were the, quote, structural underpinnings of the ideology of the society of early 19th century America, for which Andrew Jackson is one symbol. The value of Ward's study in a discussion on expansionism and evangelicalism is his linking of expansionist thought with God. Quote, the nation expanding violently needed confidence to carry on its gigantic task. In its optimism, it firmly believed that God her foreordained its success and therefore saw God's hand in the most unlikely places, end of quote. Just as Andrew Jackson's victory over the British at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815 suggested God's favoritism, so too the triumph of revivalism might have confirmed to many Americans that they were God's chosen people and the expansion of their frontier received his sanction. Norman Graebner's Empire on the Pacific, a study in American cont continental expansion, also published in 1955, argues that the idea of manifest destiny has been overstated as a root cause for expansionism. Grebner bases his interpretation on the argument that American expansionism to the Pacific was a precise and calculated move by politicians and diplomats to acquire vital sea harbors. For Grebner, Manifest Destiny only revealed itself very briefly during the Mexican War. He notes that New York Herald urged Polk to, quote, put into operation those principles and elements of power which have been committed to the hands of the American people by the Almighty for the purpose of regenerating this continent. Frederick Merck's Manifest Destiny and Mission in American History, a reinterpretation published in 1963, draws on the plentitude of newspapers that covered the expansionist movement. Merck argues that Manifest Destiny quote, expansion prearranged by heaven over an area not clearly defined, end of quote, did not represent a national spirit. Instead, a more accurate expression of the national spirit was mission, an idea present throughout American history that was idealistic, self-denying, hopeful of divine favor for national aspirations, though not sure of it. Mission was enduring and non-aggressive, whereas Manifest Destiny was belligerent and short-term, fueled by propaganda to meet specific objectives. 
for Merck, part of the quote, gospel of manifest destiny, and it's ironically his is his choice of words here, was the regeneration of other peoples. Yet he perceived this as a political regeneration rather than a spiritual one. One helpful study on Christianity for better comprehending the doctrine of manifest destiny and the remarkable territorial growth of America in the 1840s is Ernest Lee Tuveson's Redeemer Nation, the idea of America's millennial role. And this was published in 1968. Demonstrating a good knowledge of historical theology, Tuveson traces the development of America's role and mission. According to Tuveson, the concept of the United States as a chosen people to redeem the world was accepted by the majority of American, and this is his term, Trinitarian Protestants. He argues that by the early 19th century, millennialist or post-millennial thought dominated Protestants' interpretation of revelation. The idea that a spiritual millennium on earth could be realized before the second coming of Christ seemed to support a belief in manifest destiny. Quote, what happened was that the possibilities for territorial expansion in the years just after the Texan revolt came into a kind of chemical combination with the general Protestant theology of the millennium and with the already old idea of the destined greatness and messianic mission of Columbia, end of quote. As America was the redeemer nation, it was appropriate that the continent would be the appointed theater where the millennium would occur. Tuveson's work is groundbreaking in that he links millennialism to the idea of manifest destiny. Moreover, he argues that manifest destiny, though often concealing selfish and sordid motives, represent messianic promises for the eventual redemption of the world. During the 1970s, two valuable studies on American political culture were presented by Ronald Fermisano and Daniel Walker Howe. Fermisano's The Birth of Math Mass Political Parties, Michigan, 1826 to 1861, <coughs> excuse me, and this was uh, published in 1971, demonstrates that evangelical revivalism had an impact on the political sphere. Utilizing quantitative methodology, for Masano concludes that Democrats and Whigs differed mostly on issues related to whether government should regulate social morality. His study illustrates that evangelicalism was embedded in the consciousness of many Whig American voters. In the political culture of the American Whigs, this was a book published in 1979. Author Daniel Walker Howe also discusses the influence of evangelical thought on antebellum society. Howe's work on prominent Whigs argues that Whig political culture was profoundly influenced by the Second Great Awakening. Similar to uh, Formosano, Howe saw that the evangelical movement enlisted countless common people of America in the case of propagating Whig values. On the issue of territorial growth, 
Powell contends that Democrats were more eager than Whigs to embrace the notion of manifest destiny, but he did admit that Whigs could, Whigs could be tempted with the fruit of expansionism. Influenced by tracts such as Lyman Beecher's plea for the West, Whigs increasingly viewed the frontier in a more positive manner. William McLaughlin in Revivals, Awakenings, and Reform, an essay on religion and social change in America, 1607 to 1977, contends that the concept of manifest destiny was closely connected to Christianity. And McLaughlin's book came out in 1978. Arguing that the Second Great Awakening spurred Americans into embracing the new consensus ideologies of postmillennialism and Jacksonian democracy, McLaughlin sees the acceptance of the belief in manifest destiny as one result of the reformulation of what he thought was the outdated and dysfunctional Edward. Edwardian Calvinist worldview. And this is uh, speaking of Jonathan Edwards. He maintains that at the heart of American culture, quote, are the beliefs that Americans are chosen, are a chosen people, that they have a manifest or latent destiny to lead the world to the millennium. The ideological metaphorsis due to the cultural revitalization that ensued from the widespread revivals of the early 19th century period verified that, quote, the nation had at last achieved a sense of the true American union, that sort of union which makes every patriot a Christian and every Christian a patriot, end of quote. McLaughlin's provocative work is significant in that it provides a unique blueprint that follows evangelical specific specifications for the reconceptualization of expansionist historiography. Reginald Horseman, Thomas Hytela, Paul Bergeron, and Reginald Stewart are historians who published prominent works during the 1980s dealing with American expansionism. In Race and Manifest Destiny, the Origins of American Racial Anglo-Saxism published in 1981, Reginald Horseman, his aim was to discern how and why mid 19th century Americans were more concerned with the limitless expansion of Anglo-Saxonism than the liberation of other peoples. Focusing on the emergence of racial ideology Horseman, Horseman's work examines America's concept of manifest destiny from a different light than most other expansionist studies. He agrees that the idea of providence, often articulated in contemporary literature, was a common theme in which antebellum Americans believed that they were chosen for special duties not simply for special privileges. A negative implication of these duties was that Americans increasingly thought that only they as Anglo-Saxons had the wisdom and energy to guarantee the, the successful inhabitation of the continent. Horseman's work is important in that it raises the issue of whether the religious element of expansionism 
primarily advocated accommodation or exploitation of other peoples. Thomas Hytala's manifest design, anxious and aggrandizement in late Jacksonian America. This was published, first published in 18, sorry, in 1985, examines the myth of manifest destiny by ways of the themes of race, <coughs> excuse me, race, commercial power, Neil Jeffersonianism, and the American empire. He asserts that an effective assessment of westward expansion and manifest destiny must include the cultural, political, and social context of the period. He argues that on the issue of expansionism, the Democrats exploited American exceptionalist ideology to justify their chauvinism and aggressiveness. All expansionist works must to some degree confront politics. Studies on President James Polk cannot avoid the issue of territorial growth. In the presidency of James K. Polk, published in 1987, Paul Bergeron provides a sympathetic treatment of a highly effective president who saw himself as the spokesperson for Manifest Destiny. Bergeron makes his position clear that Manifest Destiny became one of the major impulses of the 1840s. Utilizing the interpretation by other expansionist scholars, he attempts to comprehend Polk's own commitments and motivations to Western expansion. Polk had always admired Methodism and at his deathbed, he insisted on baptism by this church despite his mother's wishes to accept baptism through the Presbyterian church. One must be careful not to infer too much from this single case, but because of their close connection with the frontier, Methodists were apt to view the extension of America's border more favorably than other denominations. Certainly more favorably than the, the older mainstream denominations such as Congregationalism or, or even Unitarianism. Reginald Stewart's United States Expansionism and British North America, 1775 to 1871, and this was published in 1988, examines the issue of America extending her northern borders. Devoting one chapter to the issue of Manifest Destiny, Stewart argues that the concept in its aggressive territorial form only influenced the Oregon debate and not other American-Canadian boundary disputes. And there had been disputes in the East. One example was with the state of Maine and the what would become the province of New Brunswick. Well, he maintains that the idea of America's millennial role had wide appeal in the 19th century and that American ideology interpreted the British presence in Oregon in terms of several issues, including, quote, state imposed religion, end of quote. And this is, speaks to what was the case in Britain where the Church of England, the A Anglicans were the favorite church. That was the, the state church relationship. The 
democratization of Christianity is covered by historian Nathan Hatch. He argues that Protestantism directed the most dynamic popular movements in America. According to Hatch, American churches, in contrast to British churches, were basically unhampered by external social and political pressures, and thus Christianity and liberty rarely opposed each other. Christianity was a liberating force in the American experience, quote, giving people the right to think and act for themselves rather than being forced to rely upon the mediations of an educated elite, end of quote. If common people were allowed to trust their own powerful religious impulses, believing that God sanctioned their efforts, it seems that many Americans had considerable religious freedom to easily incorporate manifest destiny into their belief system. The politics of opinion played an important role in the huge land acquisition of the late 1840s. While historians argue that large numbers of Roman Catholics often voted for the Democrat Party, studies on the church, other studies on the, on the churching of America claim that many religious historians have used overinflated statistics representing the number of Catholic immigrants. The point is that there were probably many more Protestants voting for the Democrat Party than had been suggested in the historiography. Although more work needs to be done to discern how many evangelicals voted expansionist politicians to victory, evangelicals did overwhelmingly support the war against Mexico and the eventual land annexation. The Baptists and Methodists, who together constituting nearly 70% of Protestant members in the United States, saw the war as a crusade. Quote, moved by evangelistic zeal, these denominations eagerly awaited the hour when vast new areas would be open to the true gospel of the Protestant missionary." End of quote. Though some scholars may question whether the concept of manifest destiny caught the imagination of most Americans, a massive land acquisition did occur in the 1840s. Indeed, the concept of manifest destiny appeared to be influenced by the evangelicalism of the Second Great Awakening. But it should be noted that in some cases, expansionism probably had a corrupting effect on the church. Arminian revivalism with his alliance to Wesleyan thought had provided man greater control in initiating the, sa the saving of souls. Yet the belief in manifest destiny may have given man too much control, endangering the mystery of a divine transcend transcendence. In addition, there were the dangers of zealotry as Americans promoting their chosen status could justify war that came with such expansionist efforts. And I don't address it in this lecture. There is the issue of Native Americans, the Indians who were in, in the West and who had their lands um, taken away from them by Am Americans who are surging westward. Others point to the good outweighing the bad, hardworking pioneer families seeking freedom and land when, when America expanded in the West, 
often found solace and guidance in their biblical faith. And studies too will, will point out to the uh, thriving farm enterprises, the, the success of agriculture in the West and the emerging villages, towns, and eventually cities that offer greater opportunities for many people. And economic historians, of course, will point to the rise of the standard of living with this um, flourishing. Important cultural and religious studies on the antebellum reveal that the Second Great Awakening and the resulting evangelical spirit was very much part of society. Certainly, the message of Manifest Destiny embraced both Christian rhetoric and symbolism. While it is impossible to measure the extent in which the belief in Manifest Destiny captured the American imagination and was linked to the spirit of revivalism, there is much evidence of the overlapping of revivalism and expansionism. 20th century historiography on expansionism offers good and far-ranging interpretations in an era when scholars respected the academic mission of the free exchange of ideas.